our um, two speakers here today. Uh, I'll introduce them both at this time. Um, there's uh, Dr. Brato, Lori Brato on the end. And uh, Dr. Brato has a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of BC. And she completed a fellowship in reproductive and sexual medicine from the University of Washington. She's currently an associate professor in the UBC department of ONG and head of the division of gynecologic specialties, as well as a retired psychologist pardon me, a registered psychologist <laughs> in Vancouver, Canada. She's the director of the UBC Sexual Health Laboratory, um, where research primarily focuses on developing and testing psychological and mindfulness-based interventions for women with sexual desire and arousal difficulties and women with chronic genital pain. Dr. Brado is the associate editor for two major sexuality journals, the Archives of Sexual Behavior and Sexual and Relationship Therapy, and has over 80 peer-reviewed publications. Dr. Shauna Johnson, uh, just beside me, uh, received her MD from Queen's University. She completed a five-year residency at, also at Queen's University, and then received a McLaughlin Fellowship to pursue fellowship training in urogynecology and reconstructive pelvic surgery at St. George's Medical School in London, England, under the supervision of Dr. Stuart Stanton. Dr. Johnson is currently a full-time associate professor and attending staff member in the Department of ONG at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. She's been active as the Postgraduate Program Director at Queen's from 1998 to 2003. She's served on the Nucleus Committee as a Nucleus Committee member on the Royal College Exam Board in ONG. She served as the Chair of the Postgrad Committee for the Association of Professors of ONG, APOG, from 2001 to 2003. And currently, she's also a Deputy Editor of the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology of Canada. And I'm going to turn it over to these ladies now. Okay, thank you very much. So Dr. Johnson and I are truly thrilled to be giving this presentation to you all today and uh, even more thrilled that you've managed to stay with us through to the very end of the day. Uh, we know that sexual health is a very important part of quality of life. In fact, some recent data show us that about 75% of women in their 50s, 60s and beyond continue to remain sexually active. Those of you who are familiar of the work of Pepper Schwartz, who's quite a renowned sex researcher and sociologist at the University of Washington, just finished a, a recent study of 90,000 men and women across uh, five different countries. And Pepper was looking at what are the main predictors of long-term happiness. So she looked at a variety of different self-report indices, and what she found was the single best predictor of long-term happiness was relationship satisfaction, which included sexual satisfaction. And that far outpredicted career, health, money, children, faith, etc. So it seems to be the implication that so long as one is sexually happy, the sting of bankruptcy seems to be a little bit less. So I must say that as a, as a psychologist and as a sex therapist, although I spend 100% of my time working in this area of sexual health, both research and treatment, I'm probably the last individual that women will see as a first-line uh, individual. And in fact, the research tells us that women with sexual concerns are much, much more likely to see their gynecologist first, which I suppose is also why this is on the SOGC program. So Dr. Johnson and I are going to be presenting this talk to you today and you'll uh, sense our interplay throughout the slides and this really reflects how we encounter sexual health in the women that we see. So although we encounter sexual health and difficulties through slightly different lenses, we certainly both encounter sexual difficulties in the majority of women that we, that we do encounter. So there's going to be a bit of a back and forth interplay between our presentation. Thank you, and thank you everybody for coming. Um, and again, I welcome this opportunity to talk about this very important subject. I should preface the talk, however, by saying that we are attempting to provide a collection of what we think are unique issues that challenge women's sexuality, that women face in terms of their sexuality around the midpoint of their lives, around menopause. But this is not meant to be a comprehensive talk. Um, the subject is broad, and as many of you in the audience know, sexual dysfunction in women is complex. So what we hope is to give an overview of some of the issues that we think confront women that affect their sexuality at midlife, and really focus more on the solutions for the challenges we present rather than the challenges. Please remember that there are certainly more challenges than we're presenting, and hopefully this presentation will be a provocative one, and if we have time, we can open the floor up to audience members who 
can help us discuss other challenges that are presenting to women in terms of midlife sexuality. So the objectives of this talk will be to review the medical and psychological challenges around women's sexual health at midlife and discuss options and alternatives, really solutions, that will help to assist women and their partners in um, returning to or in maintaining a normal sexual health life and probably to dispel some myths related to sexual health. So we'll begin first with the challenges. And um, the first and obvious challenge that presents to women at the time of midlife is hormonal influence. Estrogen is a hormone that maintains structural integrity of the pelvic tissues. It preserves genital blood flow and sensation, and it facilitates vaginal lubrication. And if you think of this, we could call this peripheral sexual physiology, because really we're talking about the pelvic organs or the vagina and the influence of estrogen on those structures. Clearly there is a central or a systemic influence of, of estrogen on sexuality as well, but we don't have the time to address that specific component in, the, in this lecture today. And I would also add that the influence of estrogen systemically on sexual function is complex and controversial, and it may be that there's no clear answer. But there is a clear answer when it comes to the vagina and the effect of hormone loss on vaginal function. And this is just an image which helps to um, elucidate that in pictorial form. When hormone loss occurs at the time of menopause, there are changes to the vagina that relate to a loss in genital blood flow, a loss of um, elasticity in the tissues and a loss of volume, particularly in the clitoris, in the introitus, and in the vaginal mucosa itself, in the vaginal barrel. There's a thinning of the vulvar skin and the vaginal mucosa and a loss of subcutaneous fat. And all of these changes influence not only the form of the vagina but also its function. A loss in vascularity to the vagina decreases lubrication. And a loss in lubrication that happens around the time of midlife at menopause um, that loss in estrogen, that loss of lubrication leads to the, the symptoms we are all familiar with, which are vaginal dryness and dyspareunia. And those, those symptoms have a clear impact on sexuality. There was a recent web-based survey that looked at women, women's self-report of the symptoms of vaginal dryness and dyspareunia. 56% of women reported the symptom of vaginal dryness or dyspareunia limiting their quality of life at least to some degree. And in that group of women who reported that symptom, 87% of women said it directly affected their sexual frequency and libido. So there's a clear relationship between hormone loss around the time of menopause, vaginal function, and then sexual function because of alteration in vaginal function. But it would be primitive to say that it's just about estrogen. It is not. And there are women who have no vaginal atrophy um, because it's been treated and still have dyspareunia, and there are women who have dyspareunia um, despite treatment with, for vaginal atrophy. So this, it is not as simple, the problem is not as simple as just estrogen loss affecting vaginal function, which affects sexuality. So unlike vulvovaginal atrophy, which we've just heard about, vulvodynia is um, a different pain condition the primary reason for dyspareunia or painful sex. And although the population prevalence study suggests hovers around 12 to 15 percent across ages, we do know that there's a bimodal distribution in uh, the onset of vulvodynia. So there, the most common onset would be a lifelong presentation, and we tend to see those women in the age, age range of 20 to 30. These are women who would report pain with sex or with any kind of vaginal penetration ever since their first attempts, whether it's intercourse or their first attempts at inserting a, a tampon. But then there tends to be the second um, increase in, in presentation around the perimenopause. So these are women who have experienced pain-free, satisfying sexual activity for most of their sexual life, and then with a new onset of pain. And the pain is really characterized as sharp, shooting, burning, stinging, tearing pain that again is quite separate from vulvovaginal atrophy. The causes of vulvodynia are really mixed. 
um, and the precise cause in any one individual woman is really almost impossible to decipher. But what there is some evidence for, at least with perimenopausal onset, is the role of a significant period of stress in the woman's life. And so we know that ongoing painful sexual activity can lead to stress and anxiety and interference in the quality of life. But there's actually some fairly strong evidence showing that the opposite direction of causality is also the case, where women who have a history of stressors or a history of mood or anxiety symptoms can be up to 11 times more likely to develop vulvodynia. So this is uh, also a, a very common condition in Vancouver. We have a multidisciplinary vulvodynia program which integrates pelvic floor physiotherapy, psychological counseling, as well as gynecologic care all into one center. And just to flip back to estrogen influence, I remind everybody that when we're talking about hormonal influences, we're really not just talking about hormonal influences on the vagina, but really on the entire urogenital tract. And that is important when we talk about sexuality at midlife because hormonal influences affect not just the vagina, but the entire genital tract. Estrogen has an influence on the vagina, but at the level of the urethra and bladder, there is also an influence. Estrogen receptors are present in high number across the urogenital tract, and in fact, the highest number of estrogen receptors is present in the urethra, not in the vagina. So it's a structure that is very hormonally dependent. And estrogen replacement improves urethral and trigonal bladder cytology, just like it improves vaginal cytology. It, if, when the vagina becomes estrogen deficient, there are changes in the microbiology of the vagina and changes in pH because the vagina becomes colonized with enterococcus rather than with lactobacilli. And that, in, that occurs, that change in colonization and pH occurs in the urogenital tract, in the urethra and the bladder, not just in the vagina. Estrogen replacement, when estrogen loss occurs, improves urethral closure pressure and sensory bladder threshold volume. And those are both important when we think of urinary incontinence, which is an issue confronting many women at midlife. So urogenital atrophy, rather than just vaginal atrophy, comprises conditions including urinary tract infection, either recurrent or postcoital. So a direct issue affecting women's sexuality at midlife is their predisposition from hormone loss to developing postcoital infections, which is clearly going to influence sexuality. And it also, estrogen loss causes more frequency, urgency, and dysuria, the lower urinary tract symptoms, which have an effect on sexuality and coital function as well. And the final is urinary incontinence. And urinary incontinence is a prevalent condition in all women, but the prevalence rises particularly with respect to stress incontinence around the time of menopause. There may or may not be hormonal influences at play with stress incontinence, but there is certainly a clear relationship between urgency incontinence and hormone deprivation that occurs at menopause. So estrogen loss causes or promotes incontinence in women, and that has a clear effect on sexuality. Not the least of which is that atrophic tissues from hypoestrogenism are further irritated um, by the presence of incontinence or incontinence pad protection, and that has a clear impact on sexuality. And the other, and many of you in the audience may know this already, but coital incontinence is very common. The study estimates are that about 50% of women who have stress incontinence have coital incontinence at penetration. And many women will simply avoid intercourse altogether because of coital incontinence. And that may be masked clinically in a presentation of low libido or in a presentation of sex hurts, but underlying that is coital incontinence that leads to an avoidance pattern of behavior. In addition, there's prolapse. And this is obviously an, an ex extreme example of prolapse. But prolapse is, a, a fat, is also a condition that increases um, there's a number of different causes for prolapse. Hormone influence around the time of menopause may be part of the issue, but it may be that mechanical factors that have promoted incontinence come to a threshold of presentation around midlife. And prolapse um, has many impacts on sexuality, including an altered body image and including difficulty with coital penetration at intercourse. And just as a, a clinical observation, 
coital, in con coital difficulty with penetration um, because of prolapse can unmask male erectile dysfunction. So in combination with prolapse, you suddenly have a relationship that has sexual difficulty on both angles. So let's talk about low sexual desire uh, for a few moments now, since that is the most common of the various sexual difficulties that women will present with. By the way, it's actually also the most common of the male sexual dysfunctions as well, um, even though erectile dysfunctions tends to get a lot more press and attention. So since the approval of Viagra in 1999 in Canada, there have been at least a dozen very large-scale population-based studies ex attempting to look at just how common is sexual dysfunction in women across ages. And when women are asked over the period of the last year, have you had a significant period of at least six months or more during which you lost desire for sex, your motivation for sex was lower, or uh, you were no longer accepting a partner's advances for sexual activity, the studies show fairly consistently that about a third of women will endorse this particular difficulty. When the criteria are somewhat relaxed and women are asked, what about a period of two months or more over the last year? Those studies, again, quite consistently show that about half of women will say that they experienced a decline in their sexual desire. Now, it's quite possible that some of these changes in low desire are adaptive, normative even. If one is struggling with a particular medical illness, if there's a significant stressor in one's life, if there are partner or relationship issues, it makes sense that her desire for sex is going to decrease. So it becomes very, very important as we're assessing sexual difficulties that we're also assessing distress. And that's the extent to which the woman herself is significantly bothered by the complaints. Now let me say a little bit more about this. I would say that probably about one in every five women that I that approaches me for treatment of low sexual desire will say to me, usually without a partner present, if I never had to have sex again, I would be completely fine with it. In fact, doctor, can you please focus your treatment on reducing my partner's desire for sex? That's why we're here for treatment. So in this kind of a situation, it's quite clear that the woman is seeking treatment at the behest of possibly a frustrated partner, an unhappy partner, and in that situation, we would be much better to conserve our resources and focus more on the relationship rather than restoring her intrinsic sexual desire. So what are some of the factors that contribute most to midlife changes in sexual desire? Well, interestingly, menopause per se, natural menopause, actually contributes quite, quite little when we compare it to some of the other factors. Lorraine Dennerstein, if you've read some of her work, she's spent the last two decades of her life in Australia following women through the menopausal transition and engaging in a large battery of both hormonal measures as well as psychological and sociocultural variables. And what really rises to the forefront as being the most significant predictors of changes in desire through the perimenopausal transition, number one is mood. So changes in mood, whether they're subclinical depressive symptoms or a full-blown depressive episode, will have a direct bearing on her motivation for sex. And it makes sense, given that the hallmark feature of a depressed mood is lack of motivation. Um, it may seem like it's not that surprising, but women are often surprised when you point out to them, well, they're not interested in the things that typically would really excite them. It's not that she's going to have a separate reserve of excitement that's dedicated to sexuality. The second factor that Dennerstein's work highlights as being a major predictor is feelings for the partner or relationship satisfaction. And in fact, feelings for partner and relationship satisfaction far outweigh any single predictor, sorry, any single hormone predictor or any combination of hormone predictors. Poor health, that's poor self-reported health. So women who will say, in general, my health is not that good, I struggle with my health, that's also a major predictor of, of low sexual desire in women. And then just to remember that there are other challenges that present Women, to women um, in terms of their sexuality at midlife. And those include things like obstetric scarring. In comparison to a group of women who are younger who haven't had 
um, obstetric vaginal delivery, scarring adds an element of potential dyspareunia to sexual function, which may be made worse by the changes associated with hormones that occur at the time of menopause. So obstetric scarring, which is not particularly problematic, may become more problematic in combination with urogenital atrophy, and that is a consequence of estrogen deprivation at the time of menopause. Myofascial pain is really um, a bigger and broader topic, and that's chronic pelvic pain syndromes, which we know increase with frequency and hit a peak of incidence around midlife. And in reference to what Dr. Brado just said, all chronic illness and a sense of poor health does impact sexuality. Um, and myofascial pain, particularly when it's pelvic myofascial pain, has a direct influence on dyspareunia. Myofascial pain is described as deep aching pain with focal trigger points. And the most common um, area where women have um, myofascial pain is in the shoulders and neck area, but that can, it can also be present in the pelvic floor. And it, it, its incidence uh, does increase with age, hitting a peak at around menopause. So some dyspareunia and some pelvic pain um, might be from myofascial pain rather than from atrophy. And finally, there's the issues of perimenopause. Perimenopause and menopause cause hormonal changes which influence sexuality, but there is also sort of the more practical issues like unscheduled bleeding, which has a direct effect on sexuality, particularly in women who are starting new relationships, and hot flushes and sleep disturbance, which not only may affect a woman's want for intimacy because um, of discomfort, personal discomfort with respect to hot heat and things like that, but also fatigue. And fatigue has a huge impact, as Dr. Brado said, on, on sexuality and desire. And then there are the forgotten challenges. And those are that safe sex is still important. And uh, particularly in women starting new relationships after menopause, um, there is, may still be a need for contraception, but after menopause, no need for contraception. And there is now the challenge that safe sex is important. And this may be a group of women where condom use is unfamiliar or awkward. And that degree of lack of familiarity or awkwardness may present an enormous barrier to healthy sexuality at the time of midlife. So I think that we have to remember that many women in menopause um, are pre-AIDS um, in terms of their, um, when they're starting a new relationship and they may um, need the, the, the worry or the fear or the solution to avoid uh, sexually transmitted infection may present so much of a barrier that it impacts on sexuality. So I mentioned earlier that feelings uh, for a partner are a major predictor, and in, coming back to Pepper Schwartz's large study of 90,000 uh, people looking at predictors of happiness, I think this couple was taken from the control group, not the active group. Um, but in all seriousness, relationship duration has been a variable of major interest. And interestingly, the impact of relationship duration on sexual function, all aspects of sexual function, desire, arousal, orgasm, uh, and satisfaction really take place independent of age. And that explains the very common finding we see where there may be a woman in a brand new relationship at the age of 65 with a very renewed sense of desire, arousal, and orgasmic function. So what Pepper's data show us is that hand-holding, public displays of affection, spontaneous kissing, cuddling, pet names drop. They drop by about 50% by about seven to 10 years into a relationship. And interestingly, women and their male partners, as well as their female partners, will say that this is one aspect of their sexuality that they miss the most. They miss the pet names, et cetera. Uh, and that all of the men and the women wanted far more of this, uh, this sort of um, uh, non-sexual non forms of affection. So sexual dysfunction, if we focus on a partner, if the partner is male, has a much stronger association with age than does sexual dysfunction and age in women. And so there's a strong impact of age on a man's sexual desire as well as erectile functioning. Now there's some interesting data looking at the impact of a Viagra prescription on the couple's sexual functioning and in particular on the woman's sexual functioning. 
Uh, and what some of those data show us, uh, and although those data are not very widely publicized, is that there's a direct bearing of the alteration in sexual script that happens when the male partner comes home with Viagra in hand. Now, if this is a couple that has gotten used to a particular sexual repertoire, coming home with the Viagra and having perhaps the false expectation that you take the pill and it produces the erection within 20 minutes, they're going to be sorely disappointed. And some of the data suggests that that directly contributes to about 50% of the lack of refilling of the prescription that these men will experience. So what is it about lack of communication that is so pertinent in, in these couples? Well, it becomes even more, uh, even more prevalent the longer a couple is together, and they may fall into a script where they, sell, where they say, we've been together for 30 years. I know what she likes already. Or if I have to ask him or her what they like, then that's going to seriously undermine how well we connect. And after all, we've been together for 50 plus years. But if the kinds of sexual stimulation are not optimal, painful, et cetera, and if there was a way of improving the sexual stimulation, then it would make sense that the couple would enhance their communication in order to meet those needs. The reality is, is that the majority of couples that are assessed in large studies have quite poor levels of sexual communication. Just a word or two about se uh, rigid sexual scripts, and perhaps this is reflective of the bigger culture that we live in, but there does seem to be a premium placed on penis and vagina intercourse as the gold standard of sexual activity. But in many of the cases of women that we've heard about so far today, whether it's prolapse, vaginal pain, or other reasons that could explain why intercourse is not possible, it highlights the importance of non-intercourse kinds of sexual activity. And so then the, the very uh, ritualistic kind, kinds of sexual activity that we often see, watch the evening news, turn off the TV, brush your teeth, get into bed, same side of the bed all the time, tap, 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 intercourse, ejaculation, and go to sleep. It makes sense that it's not her lack of desire for sex, but she's lost desire for the sex that she is having. So we're going to move on now to talk about solutions. Um, hopefully we've done a brief overview that should highlight some, at least some of the challenges that present women to women at their midlife in terms of their sexuality. But now we'd like to shift the focus and talk about solutions. How many of you have seen the Masters and Masters of Sex series that was on TV last year? Series one. One person, thank you. Series two is coming up in September. So Masters and Johnson uh, are, were a husband and wife duo that spent a good part of their careers studying the sexual response, and they did so by bringing couples into their St. Louis, Missouri clinic, hooking them up to a variety of psychophysiological equipment, measured everything from skin conductance to heart rate to vaginal photoplethysmography, penile plethysmography, et cetera. And as a result of their work, they formulated a sexual response cycle that really dominated the field of sexuality for about 40 years. And the model, the, the model really stated that we engage in sex because we're in the mood. Right? So there's this notion of an intrinsic or a spontaneous sexual desire that then leads one to seek out sexual activity or perhaps respond to a partner's advances. So this linear notion of desire followed by sexual arousal is really outdated and unacceptable for many, if not most, of, of the women, particularly those in long-term relationships. Um, and in fact, there's a large body of science that supports the finding that many women will start out a sexual encounter from a place of, of really sexual neutrality. Now, seeing as that it's playoff season and there's a game tonight that we're all dying to watch, I'm going to borrow an analogy that Sue Chamberlain often uses uh, with her residents, and I think it fits so well in this example as a way of helping us really understand this model of sexual response. So tonight's game four, you're feeling somewhat indifferent. There's no Canadian team in the playoff. 
but some of your colleagues ask you to join, to join them at the bar tonight and you say to yourself, well, you know, it is the playoffs and after all, that is the quintessentially Canadian thing to do, to watch the playoffs. So you decide with maybe not necessarily aversion, but also not necessarily with a lot of excitement to go along to the bar and watch the game. So you watch the game with a sense of, okay, this is interesting, I'm here with my colleagues, but not you sort of decide for yourself that you're going to go home after the game and pack it in. After all, there's a very full day tomorrow. Period one ends and you find yourself becoming interested in the game. You say to yourself, okay, I'm going to make it through the end of the, the, end of the break and I'll come back for period two. After all, both the Kings and the Rangers put on a show that was worth watching and I'll come back. Period two starts, the Rangers and the Kings come out with determination in their eyes, the skating is flawless, the passing is impeccable, and you start to get excited, you're watching the game, you start uh, talking to the television as if the players can hear you, and by the end of the second period, you find yourself with an absolute determination to come back for the third period. Third period hits, the Rangers score, now you're excited. Now you start cheering, you're high-fiving your colleagues, by the end of the game, when the Rangers win and they take it into game five, you say to yourself, boy, am I glad that I came out and watched this game. <laughs> and of course, you're gonna go back for, for game five in a couple of days. So we can take this hockey analogy and apply it to sexual response in women, somewhat facetiously here. Uh, although it, it has been studied and empirically supported in a variety of different cultures, different settings, and across different ages of women. And essentially what the circular model of sex shows us is that women engage in sexual activity for a large variety of reasons. And those reasons may be not necessarily sexual to begin with. They may relate to a wish for enhanced emotional intimacy. They may relate to a wish for feeling sexual by the end of the encounter, but her overt awareness of any kind of desire is not necessarily what is mo moving her from neutral towards open to the sexual encounter. Of course, the kinds of sexual stimuli that the woman is exposed to become absolutely key. So if the stimuli are painful or aversive or unwanted, they're not going to elicit an arousal response. But if the kinds of stimuli evoked are the ones that work for her, and here the importance of sexual communication to a partner on how to optimize those stimuli become especially important, then those stimuli can translate into an arousal response. Now, of course, many things can get in the way, get in the way of the brain's processing of those stimuli, whether it's fatigue, medications, distractions, anxieties, not liking one's partner, being turned off in the moment, multitasking and thinking about what you need to do next because we only have 20 minutes, then we've got to get on to something else. All of those factors can get in the way of a healthy sexual arousal response from, ha from unfolding. But if we suppose that those factors are not getting in the way and the woman is able to redirect her focus back onto the stimuli, then arousal does happen, both physical arousal as well as mental sexual arousal. And if she's able to stay with those sexual sensations, she now says to herself, like we do in period three of my analogy, boy, I'm sure glad that I came out for this. Now I experience some desire for more purely sexual reasons. And if the outcome is satisfying, this of course is going to reinforce her motivation the next time. So the reason I present this model is because it can be an incredibly useful tool to use with your own patients. This is not something you need to refer to a sex therapist or a psychologist to do. It would involve asking questions such as, why do you engage in sexual activity? And a fair bit of research coming out of the University of Toronto shows us that women who have at least one positive reason for sex are much more likely to be sexually satisfied than women who have no reasons or who have exclusively negative reasons for sex. A negative reason might be something along the lines of, I'm only having sex to appease my frustrated partner, etc. We can also talk to our patients about the range of sexual stimuli, and we'll be talking a bit more about this later on in this talk. And then at the level of information processing, what are all of the things that are getting in the way? Is she on medications that are interfering? Should she be referred elsewhere for improvements in mood and stress? 
Should she engage in particular kinds of skills that help her stay in the moment? And we'll come back to that shortly. So our hope is that this becomes a tool that all of you can use with your patients in the office setting. And the other practical solution, because I spent some time talking about how hypoestrogenism or the changes in hormones that happen at the time of menopause influence sexuality, is vaginal estrogen therapy. The Sexuality and You site suggests solutions to begin with starting like starting with lubricants, which improve vaginal dryness, and yes, they do, but they provide only transient benefit. Longer foreplay, which may allow the vagina more time to get lubricated, um, and, and it may improve arousal as well, and that may help. And then the third suggestion is to have sex more often, which I think is an uh, awkward solution if it hurts to have sex and the whole problem is to, um, because of that and you're avoiding sex and having it more often can't really be a practical solution. The solution really for dyspnea and dryness that contribute to female sexual dysfunction is vaginal estrogen therapy. And why? Because your genital atrophy is a consequence of estrogen deficiency. And the Cochrane database re review concluded quite clearly that at vaginal estrogen therapy improves or cures dyspnea, improves or cures vaginal dryness to a in a significant proportion of patients. It reverses the vaginal pH and vaginal cytologic change that's associated with hypoestrogenism, and it continues to work over 12 months of research follow-up and over years in clinical practice. And really, the equal efficacy, no matter what um, root of, not, not what root of administration, but what product you use to deliver vaginal estrogen into the vagina, be it a cream, a ring, or a tablet, all are equally effective and um, treat the symptoms that are causing the sexual dysfunction. There are, vaginal estrogen is also helpful for the urogenital or the urinary component to hypoestrogenism, including a reduction in urinary tract infection frequency and an improvement in urgency and um, perhaps urgency incontinence, which play into female sexuality at midlife. And then the question always remains, is vaginal estrogen safe? And you know, this is almost a whole talk in itself, but I hope that this is an audience that I don't have to do much work convincing that vaginally administered estrogens in appropriate dose are safe because they last, lack systemic absorption. So the literature in conclusion, as an overview, concludes that vaginally administered estrogens do not appreciably or durably increase estradiol levels above that which would be seen in natural menopause, that the literature also concludes that there isn't significant systemic absorption if, it's been, if vaginal estrogen is used in recommended doses and do not suggest that there is end organ effect, in other words, effect on the breast tissue or effect on the endometrial tissue with vaginal estrogens used in the appropriate doses to treat atrophy. So the bottom line, estrogen treats that component of sexuality that is related to hormonal influence, vaginal estrophy, and vaginal estrogens are safe because they last systemic absorption. So we'll spend a few moments talking about the stimuli portion of the model that I just introduced. And uh, there's a fair bit of work coming out of the Kinsey Institute that's looking at the national prevalence of certain kinds of sexual activities like vibrator use, like lubricant use. And some recent data show us that among uh, a random sample of women, these are presumably women who are not seeking treatment for sexual concern, that you can see at least half of heterosexual women um, and more than half of lesbian, bisexually identified women have ever used a vibrator alone. When looking at the numbers when paired with a partner, the numbers, at least for the heterosexual women, are slightly less. So vibrators we tend to frame within an enhancement framework. And I often find that when I introduce the possibility of a woman using a vibrator in the clinical setting, talk to her about it in the clinical setting, it's important that I language it around it being a tool. And the reason I say that's important is because sometimes I'm confronted with concerns like, what if this replaces my partnered sexuality? What if my partner it becomes concerned that I no longer want to engage in sexuality with them? Not to say that that's a concern expressed by all women, but that is often the concern that is expressed. So 
the importance of framing it, of framing this as potentially a tool that can augment her already existing sexual response that doesn't need to replace it can often be really important. What I have on the slide here are some, uh, some common vibrators, some produced by Canadian companies, which are excellent. Uh, you can see the bottom left-hand side, that vibrator that's sort of in the shape of a, of a horseshoe. This is called the WeVibe, the WeVibe 4, produced by a small Canadian company. And it's designed so that the lower portion is inserted vaginally, the upper portion provides some vulvar clitoral stimulation, and the woman can still have uh, vaginal penetration through intercourse at the same time. So if the woman is with a male partner, then he would receive stimulation to the penis at the same time. Um, you can see the vibrator resting up against the iPhone, and you may be wondering, what on earth is that about? Well, there's a variety of different ways that the iPhone can be used also as an enhancement product. So there's a variety of different apps, and if I see everyone reaching for their phones right now, I'll know what you're doing. But there are a variety of different apps that actually turn the iPhone into a, into a vibrator. Uh, the ratings te tend to be somewhat uh, mixed, and so there would, it, you might encourage your women to try around the different, the different applications. But what you see here on the slide actually is a particular um, one called the Vibe Ease. And what this involves, I think this is a really nice illustration of the integration of both psychological arousal as well as physical response. And so while the woman is looking at her phone, she's re either reading or listening to a sexual fantasy. And depending on the contents of that fantasy, the vibrator has a corresponding intensity of vibration. So if, for example, in the fantasy, the fantasy gets to the point where the narrator's voice says, your skin is soft and silky, there might be a soft vibration, but then when it gets to the more heated components of the fantasy, then the vibrator starts to vibrate uh, much, much stronger. Um, the Hitachi Magic Wand is also a, um, a, a very, very old vibrator, but one that very, very consistently comes with excellent ratings. And vibrators can be an excellent uh, option for women because they can be purchased online. So for women that, for a variety of reasons, including embarrassment, may not want to go into a sexuality store, they can be purchased quite discreetly online. So Sensate Focus also, if we stay within that domain of enhancing sexual stimulation at midlife, Sensate Focus is a very old technique, also born out of the Masters and Johnson era, that involves uh, a couple. And it do really doesn't matter if the couple uh, is a heterosexually identified couple or a same-sex identified couple. The purpose of Sensate Focus is to teach one another what are the kinds of stimulation that are pleasing to the partner. So how it works is one is partner A would touch partner B, starting out non-genitally and not on the, the breast or chest. And the role of the person receiving the touch is number one, to relax, of course, because many of these encounters can become very, very stressful. Number two, to try and really tune into those sensations. And number three, to provide verbal feedback to a partner. So they might say something along the lines of, that feels really good, keep doing that. Or, you know, if you move just a little bit to the right, that feeling would be so much more better. And then the giver of the touch, the giver of the touch would alter their touch so as to enhance the stimulation. After about 15 minutes, they switch roles, and now the giver becomes the receiver, the receiver becomes the, the, the giver. Ideally, this takes place once per week, and after stage one is complete, stage one being non-breast and non-genital, and after the couple feel like their learning has plateaued with phase one, they would then move on to phase two, which now includes both genital as well as breast touch. The goals of the touch, however, are the same. It's not necessarily to create arousal or to create an orgasm, but rather to put one another in tune with the kinds of stimulation that are really effective for that person and as a means of enhancing how they communicate about sexuality. And, and Sensate Focus highlights the importance of communication and it also highlights that it's not just about vagina and penis. And so this slide is just to remind you that there are other ways that a couple can be sexually intimate. And that includes partner masturbation. And in fact, a, a woman can be um, intimate with herself by self-masturbation. And then, as Dr. Brado highlighted earlier, the importance in a relationship of 
pet names and cuddling and stroking is a form of sexual intimacy. And for couples that cannot achieve, at least initially, sexual intimacy by, through vaginal coitus, there are um, other ways to be sexually intimate with a partner. And these even include what is clinically termed extracoital intercourse, and that is um, oral sex or um, non-penetrative vaginal sex. And those are, those are recommendations that sometimes help. Sometimes patients need to be given permission um, or need to have someone help normalize those things, but they are absolutely elements of sexual intimacy that can be very important for a partner and for a couple. So for the remaining few minutes of our talk, um, I'd like to focus on two very specific psychological techniques that you don't need to refer to a psychologist or a sex therapist to do. Uh, and our hope is that you will leave this room with a feeling of empowerment that you can do this with your own patients yourself. So the two techniques I'm going to be describing very briefly, one is cognitive behavioral therapy and one is mindfulness meditation, both of which are associated with a rather large empirical basis to them, which I will not be taking, which I will not be discussing. You can just take my word for it that they are evidence-based treatments. Um, and the first one here, cognitive behavioral therapy, really highlights for us the integral nature of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So the idea is that in order to feel better, and that includes sexual feelings, we change how you think and what you do. So let me give you a very common example. The woman is in her bedroom, she's undressing, getting ready for bed, partner walks in, sees her naked, and the situation stops there with her feelings of anxiety and in some cases even horror. So what you would say with a patient in this situation is in that moment, what were you feeling? And she would say, I felt anxiety, I felt an enormous pressure to have sex with my partner right then. And then you would say, well, what were the thoughts that went along with that? And she would say, well, my partner looked at me. And for me, when my partner looks at me, that automatically cues me to my partner's wish for sexual activity. And therefore, I respond by cringing, by having some muscle tension, by quickly covering myself up, by distracting the conversation. Now, in reality, it may be that the partner just happened to look at her, that there wasn't necessarily any invitation for sexual activity. But in her own mind, because that connection between how partner looked at her and the inevitability of sex is so automatic, her negative response also can become quite automatic. So how you would do this with a patient is you would literally have her itemize what are the thoughts that are elicited, what are the specific feelings, and what are the behaviors. And then because CBT is a change-oriented approach, what you would do in a bit of a Socratic way is you would say, okay, you have some evidence that supports your thoughts, but is there any evidence that perhaps your thoughts are irrational, that they're not true? And she would come back and say, well, yes, all my partner did was look at me. There was no mention of sex. There was no no reaching out, nothing like that, etc. This is the process of changing thoughts to change how you feel. And this could be something that you gave to a patient just with those three empty boxes and you would encourage her to do either on her own or there are a variety of excellent self-help workbooks focused on general CBT but also CBT for sexual difficulties. But I'm going to talk about a different technique which is mindfulness meditation, which is an area of increasing um, evidence-based support in a variety of different areas of medicine, and as well as sexuality, including genital pain. And our research in Vancouver um, has contributed a fair bit to this, to this literature. So mindfulness is our ability, which we all have, to completely inhabit the present moment to not be multitasking, not be checking our phone, not be thinking about what we're going to do at 5 o'clock, not even rehearsing what's happening tomorrow or replaying the events of the day, but fully inhabiting the here and now. And with guides, whether they're audio guides or self-led guides, one can be taught how to focus one's attention onto the sensations in the here and now, whether they be visual sensations tactile sensations, taste, smell, etc. 
Mindfulness has been applied to sexual desire and arousal, and what we find is that women can become much more in tune with the early signs of arousal, which then significantly enhances their subsequent desire. Mindfulness can also be used to help women let go of the suffering that goes along with sexual pain and experience the sensations of pain themselves in a way that becomes much more tolerable for them. So thinking about how this might be applied to your own patients, when you get into conversations about multitasking and worrying and projecting, etc., a simple instruction such as, when you're being sexual, what do you really feel? What are the sensations that emerge? And can you follow those sensations as they're emerging during touch, etc.? And you have a woman track this. Um, ideally, she would be practicing this in her life in general, in all aspects of her life, so that the generalization to the sexual scenario can be that much greater. So then the final thing is knowing when to consult. And I, when I put my gynecologist hat on, I would say that when, when do I seek treatment for women who are having sexual dysfunction at midlife? Um, as a gynecologist is when I cannot identify vaginal atrophy or vaginal dryness and dyspareunia as symptoms that are contributing significantly to uh, sexual dysfunction or when I have treated vaginal atrophy and the dyspareunia has not improved. The vaginal dryness has not improved, but to my clinical eye, the vagina looks well estrogenized. When there are not structural gynecologic issues like incontinence or prolapse that are playing into sexuality, and please be clear that many women have incontinence and prolapse without sexual dysfunction. So only when the two seem to be related um, would I think that that's a gynecologist um, uh, purvey and when there aren't issues like that perhaps it's better in somebody else's hands and when simple education which is probably the most important thing about communication about um, uh, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and about mindfulness simple office counseling has not provided relief and then the final thing and I think Lori would agree with me is when there are significant relationship issues um, I think that's really out of the, um, the context of a gynecologist um, and that may be underlying sexual dysfunction. But f from a gynecologist's point of view, it's when you can intervene from the point of view of vaginal atrophy, when you can intervene from the point of uh, structural things or when you can intervene from educational point of view and none of those things have worked. So we're going to end there, and we're happy to take any of your questions. And maybe I'll start with the first one <laughs> for, for, uh, for Shauna. Um, do you ever collaborate in the office setting with a sexually health trained professional? Well, I work at Queen's University in Kingston, and I wish I could say yes, but unfortunately we're somewhat limited in our clin clinical interactions with a sex sexual therapist. And I see an enormous role um, to provide education to patients and to assist us in learning simple strategies like cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness. So I guess the answer is no, but would it be valuable? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I had a question uh, just for Lori. I, I certainly appreciated the recommendations uh, for, for types of vibrators. Um, I, I find that that's a question that a lot of patients have for me. And, uh, another question that they have is, is what to read. Mm -hmm. Okay, what to read. Um, well, given that most of, the, most of our patients have probably read Fifty Shades of Grey, um, and I think although the, the book itself I could spend an hour critiquing. I think what it has done for women is it's put them in touch with their ability to fantasize and with uh, a sense of a reawakening of their physical sexual arousal response. So what I often say to women is given the enormous heterogeneity in women's tastes, experiment with reading different kinds of literature. Um, I find with my patients that I see, they like the Nancy Friday books, which are quite old books, but they're a collection of very, very short story fantasies, and they're just enough to reframe women's focus of attention from everything else they were doing onto something really quite sexual. 
Um, I should also mention that on the, uh, in partnership with the SOGC, sexualityandyou.ca has some wonderful resources online for vibrators, lubricants, and other kinds of sexual enhancement tools that you can certainly l let your patients know about. Are there any other questions? Where do we find this sexual therapy expertise? If you live in Ontario, you are lucky to have Best Co, which is the only province in Canada that has board certified sex therapists. You can go on the Best Co website and narrow it down by geographic area. The other provinces do not have that, but Best Co does keep an informal list of sex therapists across the country. There's also um, STAR, S-S-T-A-R, uh, which is Society for Sex Therapy and Research, and they keep an online directory of sex therapists in North America. I will say that there are many individuals who are not licensed or registered who are doing what they call sex therapy, and so you just want to be careful that you um, have a relationship or have at least tested out some of the authority of whomever you're referring to. I think we have time for one more question. Um, sorry, this is actually two questions. One is the role of androgens, because people will often ask, what about Simple testosterone? question, yeah. Yeah, and then the second question, also not simple, is what do you do for vestibulitis? So I'll, I'll tackle the first question. Um, the, the role of androgens is complex, and it's sort of like the, um, the question about, is, does systemic estrogen have an effect on libido? And um, the, the data would suggest that the, the randomized control trials that are out don't really show any benefit in um, improving desire or arousal over placebo, although there is a huge placebo effect. So in the interest of time, I can say that um, androgens probably don't have a clear clinically established role for improving sexual desire or arousal in women, and um, not to diminish that there are potential risks to using systemic estrogens. Vaginal estrogens clearly don't have any benefit over placebo. Vaginal testosterone, I'm sorry. And I'll answer the question about vestibulitis or provoked vestibulodynia. Um, and it, it's not clear if you're asking about in the perimenopausal or, or in the, or in the premenopausal woman. In the perimenopausal woman, assuming that vaginal estrogen has not has not ameliorated her, her symptoms. Uh, the approach that we take in Vancouver and certainly supported by much of the science, and we did a workshop on this last year at SOGC, is in support of a multidisciplinary approach where first line treatment is a combination of pelvic floor physiotherapy as well as psychological skills in pain management. In our own center, which is based in the Department of Gynecology, the use of medications is really uh, secondary. Uh, following at least a three-month period where the woman has used psychological skills and pelvic floor physiotherapy. Uh, David Foster's work very consistently shows that the efficacy of some of the oral medications is about the same as a placebo. So while those, the, those are probably the easiest to prescribe to patients, they can have about the same efficacy with the placebo, and there's a significant side effect profile that, frankly, most women just don't find tolerable. Um, I have two questions. I often hear from my postmenopausal women. Um, they ask a very simple question for which I have no answer. Um, they say, Doc, now that I'm over 50, is it natural for me to have lower sexual desire or is it pathological? And the second thing is, is Viagra approved now for women? Um, let me tackle the second question. So Pfizer sponsored trials of Viagra in women for about a two-year period in the early 2000s, and all of those trials were stopped because it was not found to be effective at all. Um, there is some off-label use of Viagra in some very select samples of women, women with diabetic neuropathy, women with multiple sclerosis, um, not with very high efficacy, but for the most part, Viagra has, has, has not been found to be very effective, and it's because of uh, its exclusive effect on enhancing vaginal vasal congestion, which is really not the main cause of sexual dysfunction in the majority of women. Uh, your first question about the extent to which changes in desire are normative, given a woman's age versus something more pathological, 
you know, sexuality is, is completely subjective. There is no, there are no objective criteria that say if she falls below a certain number of sexual events per month, then she's in the dysfunctional range. So a woman really serves as her own control. However, if her changes in desire can be accounted for by normal life facets, uh, such as struggling with other issues or health, then we would absolutely not diagnose that as a sexual dysfunction. But age itself, um, I suppose that was the, the specific question, age itself is not a significant predictor of low desire in women. I think the take home message is that in, in both men and women, desire does decrease with time, but particularly with relationship duration, which maybe isn't a positive comment to end on. <laughs> but um, the um, it, desire is a common reason to seek sexual encounters early in a relationship and especially with women of an un increasingly less common reason to seek sexual intimacy as a relationship continues. So it's probably normal. It's not normal when it's disruptive to a woman's quality of life, I guess. Thank you very much.